what's being said here that I need to walk away with? I'm surrounded by death, inevitable destruction, and yet to the humble and those who are rejoicing in God, God is also rejoicing in them. Welcome to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel is a ministry that's dedicated to speaking the gospel out of every corner of scripture. In Luke 24, Jesus told his disciples that every part of the Bible was about him. So each week, hosts David and Seth work through a passage of scripture to see how it's all about Jesus and his good news. Let's jump in. Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We are finishing our discussion on the book of Zephaniah, the hidden one. Seth, how are you doing today? You almost forgot your microphone. I almost forgot my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh, apparently a very long recording day. Where apparently. I just forget the microphone is not in front of me. <laughs> okay, so last time we talked about Zephaniah and the inevitability of judgment. Judgment's yeah. coming against Israel no matter what. Right. And there's nothing they can do about it. And we talked about why that was surprisingly good news yeah. to accept the inevitability of judgment because God's judgment is never for the purpose of annihilating his people, but purifying them mm -hmm. and making it possible for the meek and the humble to inherit the earth. Right. And that just because the humble are a part of the judgment and swept up in the judgment, that's not the end of their story. That's right. Because that's right. God always brings flourishing in life mm -hmm. after inevitable death. Yeah. So that was just that was cool. It was a fun. I, I really, really enjoyed the last okay. episode. So get us back into the historical moment of Zephaniah because okay. it's been a little while. Yes, yes. Zephaniah is a prophet during the reign of King Josiah. Right. King a Jos reformer. Yeah, King Josiah was a great reformer, famous for uh, taking out all the idols, making restoring some semblance of following God's law. He found a copy of it and yeah. brings all God's people to hear it and re read it aloud. Didn't they like practice uh, Passover for the first time? It was time? one of the greatest Passover since the time of Samuel. Whoa. And so I'm actually not quite sure, but it's the way that it's written, it almost sounds like, yeah. like since Samuel, like no a, national, a national Passover had ever happened until the time of Josiah. However, Josiah was also told that inevitably... Babylon would come and destroy Israel. Josiah himself dies trying to prevent that prophecy from happening. And we talked about that right. he, last he's week. Doing all these good works. He's obeying the law down to the T, throwing the biggest Passover feast that's Passover? Passover? Passover feast that's ever happened. Yeah. And yet it's not enough to turn back God's yeah. destruction of Israel. Yeah. And the call of obedience is to receive the death that's coming in order to receive life on the other side. Right. Which is something we talked about off air that I wanted to bring up here as we transition into the next episode was how much that hit me that Josiah was kind of trying to be a legalist in a sense. Right. Where, and it's like, I mean, I'm not like throwing him under the bus there. Like he, he was trying to be faithful. He's trying to save his nation. Yes. Too. And yeah, and be faithful. But no matter how much he did, mm -hmm. he couldn't escape God's wrath. You know, yeah. he couldn't escape the coming destruction. And that's true for all of us. Like, right. no matter how much we do, that's not going to get us out of death. Like, yeah. we're not going to not die because we're really, really good people. Yes. Death is inevitable. It's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the good news is that we trust God in that death. Mm -hmm. We put ourselves under what he said about what comes after death in humility. Mm -hmm. And we accept the fact that embrace, he will bring life. Yeah, we embrace Jesus' death. Right. Embrace the death that demands in our own lives, the crosses it demands us to carry. Yeah. And we receive life as a result. Yeah. We don't try to beat back death with our life. We know that we know. will get life by accepting the death. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, just want to land that plane again. Yes. All it right. Was good. So inevitable judgment is coming for the proud, but the humble can be hidden, which is what the name Zephaniah means. That's right. The hidden one. And we defined pride as putting yourself over God and defining good and evil for yourself. We also defined it as the unwillingness to accept death. Right. Being unwilling to accept God's judgment yep. is a form of pride. That's right. And then humility was putting yourself under God and what he said and believing what he said and being willing to 
accept death mm-hmm. that it's coming. Yeah. Okay. In so hopes that in hopes that he will bring and knowing that he will bring life on the other side that's of right. it. That's right. Okay. So that's chapters one and two. That's chapters one and two. Can we try to say this like narratively? Okay. Zephaniah, what is his what is his missionary goal here? His prophetic goal. Because yeah. he's not, it's not to turn back suffering. You know, other prophets are like, repent for the day is coming. And like, maybe if you repent, he'll this, turn back. This will turn back. Yeah. But it's not. It's so not his, that. it's not that it's, is it to humble yourself to accept the coming death? I think so. Because you want to be the humble ones that experience God's judgment of the evil powers above you. You want to be the hidden ones yeah. so that you can inherit the earth once all the proud and evil ones have been washed away. Yeah. Like that's that's the hope. Yeah. Is that you're a part of that remnant. He wanted everybody to say the words of that old hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Let me hide myself in thee. Yes. Like so right. that when the mountain falls, I'm hidden in the cave of mm-hmm. God's provision. Yeah. That's okay. Right. All right. So Zephaniah is talking to a, a nation that is on the brink of war, but they are some of them might be holding out hopes that they could manipulate Yahweh into Changing his mind through different yeah, obedience. Yeah, Josiah's doing all these reforms, kicking out evil priests yep. and reforming all these practices. So in a large part, Zephaniah is speaking to these same corrupt institutions and the people that are involved in them as well. Yes. Yeah. And But there's no way to turn it back. It's either humility or pride. Death is coming for all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so what do we have then in chapter three? Well, three continues with more death. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So look, okay. it's... Zephaniah chapter 3 ha- has one of the most quoted verses in, in the Old Testament where God sings over his people. Right. He quiets us with his love. He sings over us. And I'm really excited to get there. Yeah. But let's get through the last little bit of judgment first. Okay. So, so far, structurally, chapter 1 was a series of judgments against Israel. Chapter 2 was a series of judgments against the pride of nations. And it ended with the announcement of the coming downfall of Nineveh and Assyria, that they, because of their pride, because they said, I am, and there is no one else, Mm -hmm. God will destroy them. And then we get another nation mentioned, and it says this in chapter three, woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. Now, what's interesting is that word oppressing is the word Jonah. Hmm. So woe to her who is rebellious and defiled. Jonah's city. Oh. So you're like, oh, that's got it. We're still talking about Assyria, right? right. We're still we talking just about, talked about her. We're so, just, yeah. we're, right. She listens to no voice. But wait a second. Didn't Nineveh listen to God's voice at one point? Oh, I see what's happening. She accepts no correction. Wait a second. A, no, Nineveh did, did accept correction. She does not trust in Yahweh. Uh-oh. She does not draw near to her God. Jonah's city isn't the city Jonah went to. It's yes. the city Jonah came from. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. and, that's good. And the ambiguity there in those first few lines makes you realize that Israel is no different than all the other nations around Yeah. Her. So you have all these other proud nations. Israel might think they're different somehow. They got their own, their own section for breaking God's law, but they're not proud like the other nations. Yeah. No, the ambiguity reveals they are proud and corrupt just like every other nation on earth. Dang. So it's like not only is Zephaniah saying that Israel is now as bad as Nineveh. That's right. They might even be worse because mm-hmm. Nineveh did receive correction. Yes. You know, she did trust in God. That's right. But Israel's not. That's Yeah, it's kind of... Dang. Yeah, and then she, he says this, her officials within her are roaring lions and her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Now, I just passed over that multiple times until Christine pointed something out to me one of our staff writers oh one of our staff writers she mentioned the tribe of judah yeah the blessing that jacob gave to his son judah was that he would be like a lion oh right yes and the blessing the lion of judah the lion of judah and the blessing that he gave his son benjamin was that he would be like a wolf oh okay these powerful animals powerful protecting their own like majestic dominion over their land um and those that was the blessing judah gave his sons okay Cool. Here, these things have been turned, those gifts yeah. given to his sons have been turned into curses against God's people. Hmm. Her officials within her are roaring lions, and her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. 
These oh. people who were supposed to be the protective animals of God's people have begun eating their own. Have begun eating their own. Oh man! It's like a total reversal. Yeah, of, it's the difference between like, <laughs> all right, so the line of Judah is this big lion, and you're his you're Israel. You're his cubs, and you're going to yep. be safe in the pride. Yeah. Versus, here's a really hungry lion in the zoo, and we're going to throw you into the cage. That's that's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> wolves hunt in packs and bring food in yeah. the evening so that you wake up and can feast. These wolves consume their own people until they're nothing but carcasses. Whoa. Like It's oh. like, this is God's opinion of Israel. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord hasn't changed. Mm. He is righteous. He does no injustice. Each dawn, he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. Oh, that's interesting to talk about God's consistency through this because they're saying, oh, God's not going to do good. God's not going to do evil. That's right. God doesn't care. You know, look at, look around. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, the the leaders are corrupt. It doesn't matter. God's the same way. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I've not changed. I still do justice. You used to be a protective lion. Now you're a cannibalistic lion. You've changed. You've changed. I have not. not. Yeah. Because I have not changed. But because you have failed your original calling, I will come right. and judge Israel for its evil. Ooh. Yeah, an intense final judgment. And then he con- goes on and explains part of the reason why he's so frustrated with Israel. And he says, the reason I cut off all these other nations, the reason all these other civilizations have lied in ruins, was in hope that you would say something like, in verse 7, surely they will fear me and will accept correction. And then your dwelling places would not be cut off according to all that I've appointed against you. The Mm. idea here is if they would have seen what was happening in the surrounding world, God did that in order to correct them, saying, look what I'm doing to pride throughout the world. Right. Look what I'm doing to evil and injustice and idolatry around the world. I'm judging it. Yep. I expected you to learn from that. Right. Instead, you've become indecipherable. In, in um, not indecipherable, but like... um, Indistinguishable? Indistinguishable from all the nations around you. You've not learned... You've not paid attention. Hmm. He sent all these signs and they're not paying attention. Yeah. They're not fearing God. They're not accepting correction. Yeah. Okay. And then he says, verse 8, climactically, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, and to pour out upon them my indignation and all my burning anger, because in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Hmm. And that's the final, like ending line of this prophecy man uh, it's, the, inter- uh, the, the it's interesting that he lands on his jealousy there yeah that you know the lord your god is a jealous god you know as he self-identifies in exodus mm-hmm. why do you think god pulls out jealousy here at the end of this mm. climactic prophecy i'm wondering i i keep forgetting i know that like to be angry is the same hebrew word to be hot right yeah. right and I'm forgetting the root word of jealousy. Mm. Is there like a temperature component to the word <laughs> jealousy? And like the reason why all these words together is just a fun linguistic link together with them. I, I forget. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. And although they're not like the same root word or anything, you know, anger, like you said, does have that like getting hot in the nose kind yeah. of kind of idea to it. And it, it does say that jealousy also has this to get heated kind of thing and i'm like i mean yeah when i get mad it's like my face gets hot I'm when i get jealous, jealous or my stomach starts turning yeah it starts get, getting yeah. boiled yeah yeah and so i get that but it's also mm. not just like a language connection between the two it's also the reason you know i was trying to get this at the last episode is like why is god getting angry mm-hmm. and it's like oh it's because he loves his people yeah because jealousy when it's when it's good and for god it's good it's not some kind mm. of stalker yeah, you know, butt hurt jealousy. Right. It's a pure love that he's jealous, and this is what we talked about last time. He's jealous that his people don't love the most lovable thing. Yeah. He's, he's not. He's not jealous of his people only. He's jealous for his people. Yeah. He wants something other than what they currently have. Yeah. They have like, he wants them for himself right. because he loves them. Right. Like, like that's you what... think about a father who sees their son just throwing their life away. He's jealous for them. He's yeah. jealous for them. I want something better for you than what yes. you're doing. So they put him in rehab. You know? Right. They clean up his life. Yeah. In yeah. his anger, 
Yes. He cleans up his life. And his jealousy for his son, mm-hmm. they're going to do something to clean up his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An intervention. Right. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. So God mm. is jealous for his people because he loves them so much. Yes. That he wants to clean up what's going on and consume not only Israel, but the nations. That's right. Through, it will be Babylon. Yeah, through his the fire of Babylon. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and again, we said this in the last episode, but Babylon is not mentioned. Right. Uh, Assyria because, is. Assyria is. But they've be- already had their historic time in the right. sun. Right. Assyria is only mentioned because it's one of the nations that God will used. judge. Yeah. Oh, and will judge. That's and, right. Yeah. yeah. However, remember, we said this in the last episode, but the idea here is that God wants to put the emphasis on his divine action. Right. In doing the judging and doing the protecting and the hiding and okay. rather than uh, putting another nation there. So final lines said, my burning the fire, my burning jealousy will come and all the earth will be consumed. Okay. Now we've talked a lot already about um, the purifying nature of this fire, mm-hmm. but so far in Zephaniah, that's not been super clear. Mm. So far we've been told to expect to be hidden from the day of God's there's wrath. A, there's a consuming fire coming. Right, that we can and, be hidden and from and, hide and then from maybe it. come back out of once it's over. Yes. But the purpose of that fire, what is that purpose? And we're told here. Okay. At that time, I will change the speech of my peoples to a pure speech mm. that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Why, why, why speech is he? Why is he focusing in on speech here? Let me read one more oh, okay, sorry. verse, and then I think maybe you'll get it. Okay. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Does that clarify it? No. So all these two verses yeah. are all from Genesis 11. Oh. Where the Tower of Babel is described as a place of unified speech, where right. people are all in one accord together, and then they're scattered throughout the earth. And we've already made mention of the fact that Israel is now indistinguishable from the nations around them. And one of those nations around them is Babylon. And so now here he says, but on that day of my fire, I will reverse the day of Babylon. I will reverse the tower of Babylon, the reverse the tower of Babel all those days ago. And I will change your proud speech into pure speech. And you'll be of one accord and I'll gather my scattered people and I'll purify them once and for all. The unified language of the Tower of Babel was what? Pride. Human pride oh, okay, yeah. was the language of Babylon. They all spoke one language, and in pride, they try to build their way up to heaven. Yeah. And so to say that God is going to purify people's speech is, is another way of saying he's going to undo all pride. I see. He's going to put humility in their mouth. Okay. He's going to reverse the Tower of Babel. And after Babylon comes, there's going to be a dispersion mm-hmm. again. Right, and so to say that he's going to gather in the dispersed. So from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughters, my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. I think the idea here is they'll be gathered into Jerusalem right. on that day. And yeah. Then, yes. So is this also like a prophecy of return from exile? I think, like at least implicitly, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, from beyond the rivers of Cush. Like, I don't know how many followers of Yahweh they were out there during this period of right. Israel's history but yeah. during but the I wondered if like, exile yeah, yeah during the exile they all scattered. Yahwehism goes out and then a faithful remnant comes back that's right is how the story plays out that's right eventually I'm like right now I'm sitting here going oh that's a cool connection to the Tower of Babel mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I don't know if I'm like freaking out yet or okay. if I should be <laughs> okay okay yeah, yeah yeah but like is there something I'm missing about like why on earth He's looping in a reversal of Babel. Yeah. Because I wasn't expecting to run into the Tower of Babel here. Yeah. Well, one, we got a couple of reasons here. One, the Tower of Babel uh, is more accurately called the Tower of Babylon. Okay, right. So we know Babylon's coming. We know Babylon's coming okay. to destroy Israel. But now we're being told that whatever Babylon does will be reversed. Mm. And ba- whatever Babylon does will make his people pure once again. Whatever Babylon's going to do, it's going to be reversed. I see. Okay, so l- l- let me try. Yeah. So Babylon's coming. Mm-hmm. They're going to wipe you out. No hope. That's right? right. Once again, it actually looks like the Tower of Babel's being built. Right. And think about just Babylon. They built a giant pyramid-like structure yep. that was just like the Tower of Babel, right. all the way, a ziggurat, all yep. the way back in Genesis 11. And the whole world yep. was falling under the empire wing of Babylon. Yep. 
in the Empire of Babylon during this particular time of history, everyone was speaking Babylonian. Yep. Like the world was united under the, this proud nation yeah. and the language of that proud nation. And Israel was indistinguishable from it in yep. many ways. So if you're an Israelite who knows your Bible, you're yep. saying like, well, once Babylon takes us, we're all the way back at the worst part of our history. That's right. Right. Before everything went to pot. Mm -hmm. And we're just back under Babylon's rule. Has nothing progressed past Genesis 10 and 11? Mm -hmm. Like, that's mm -hmm. terrible. Right. That's right. And what he's saying is, no, once the Tower of Babylon takes over Israel, mm -hmm. I'm going to unwork it. That's right. And when it's unworked, it's not only Babylon's destruction that's going to come, but the healing of the nations mm -hmm. and the restoration of my people to Israel. Right. When the Tower of Babylon fell, the first time nations were scattered. Yes. When this Tower of Babylon falls, all God's people will come together and speech that used to be proud yeah. will now become speech that is humble. Okay. So that's cool. That's why this is here. I'm excited now. That's why this is here. Yeah. I get it. What's next? Yeah. And on that day, you will no longer be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. No more shame. Canceled shame. Deal. I will remove from your midst the uh, arrogant ones, you, your proudly exultant ones, and there shall no longer be any pride in my holy mountain. I'm going to take away all pride, take away everything, just like I've been saying all this time. Do, do you think that means that he's taking away proud and haughty people or proud and haughtiness, like pride and haughtiness? Like there. Let me keep going okay. because that question gets more complicated. Oh, no. Uh, and I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. Oh, okay. And they will seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. And they shall do no injustice, and they shall speak no lies, nor shall there be any deceit found in their mouth. No deceitful tongues will be found in their mouth. And that's interesting mm. because Isaiah, in Isaiah 53 verse 9, talks about no deceit being found in people's mouths. Oh, yeah. But it's actually an image of the Messiah. The suffering servant is the one who has no deceit set found in his mouth. Right. So well, the reason I said wait on, like, who is he talking about here? Is he taking away pride right. and humility as a like, place where like, humility as categories or right. proud people? Because I don't even know necessarily who is this one who does no injustice and speaks no lies. Right. Is it all of God's people? Yeah. Is it a particular one of God's people because that after all this happens then they'll graze and lie down and none will be made afraid mm. what's happening here who's who are we talking about right now right so there's a whole bunch of stuff here that I want to like camp out in and talk about okay let's do it there's a coming day when the Tower of Babel will be reversed, all of God's people will start speaking humbly again and will be gathered back into his capital city, Jerusalem. Okay. All shame will be cast away. Forgiveness will be given. And then only the humble and lowly will be left. And none of the people of Israel will do injustice or speak lies anymore. Seems impossible. It seems impossible. <laughs> and so in my mind, I keep thinking like, well, obviously... Jesus is this person. Right. I can see that. Jesus is the person who does no injustice, right. who does no lives. He's literally calls himself, describes himself as humble and lowly. Right. So God's going to make it so that Jesus is the only person left alive. Right. <laughs> right. Is, that, is one way to read that. Right. But the other way to read it is like, no, perhaps all God's people will be this way. Mm. On this day of the Lord. When he comes and reverses the Tower of Babel, deceit is taken away, injustice rules, and pride is taken away too. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a both and, right? Jesus comes and does it first and shows us a new way to live. And then that's, I guess it would, we would then need to have the special sauce that he has. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Like the tongue that he has, the, the freedom from shame, the freedom from pride. Mm -hmm. The spirit of humility that he had would need to be given to us right. in order for us to do this impossible thing that it seems like only right. Jesus could do. Which is why I think this passage is talking about the day of Pentecost. When that spirit comes from Jesus when that to burning his people. fire comes. Oh. <gasps> the fire of my jealousy that consumes all the earth? Yeah, the, Say fire, you? the fire of God's jealousy falls on his people 
yep. from all over the, the world the gathered together there on the day of. Oh, and he says, it is my desire to gather the nations right. and then pour out my fire on them. Right. Stop. Uh, right. You have to stop. <laughs> right. So <laughs> the day that this happens where he, and what, what, and what happens? The Holy Spirit comes on them and they start speaking. In and what? Tongues. In tongues. Not and deceitful tongues. Not deceitful tongues, but they speak the truth of mm. the gospel to all people. And, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I think this day right here, the reversal of the Tower of Babel, the day when God's fire falls, yep. is the day of Pentecost. Right. And the day after, the one whom no deceit was found in his mouth and no injustice was in him, and the one who was truly humble and lowly, comes and lives in his people like a fire. And that fire no longer burns us, but purifies us, us and makes us so that's all that's left in us by his spirit. He will change the speech of the people to a pure speech. To a pure speech. By actually giving us the tongue of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Oh, man. Right? That's incredible. Isn't that cool? That is really cool. It's just also really cool to see how that is a, a really intense statement that we ended the prophecies of Zephaniah on. You're right, in 3.8. That's eight, right. That's where right. it's like, I'm going to gather all the nations together and just pour out my consuming fire on them. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's terrifying. Yeah. But it's in Jesus. Right. It's made to be like the best news ever. Well, and th- and think about it just a different way. Okay. Jesus died during Passover. It was one of the feasts where Jews from all over the world would gather. Mm-hmm. And then they would celebrate the fact that God delivered them out of Egypt, right? Right. And so in one sense, the whole earth was gathered in Jerusalem. And what happened when Jesus died on the cross? He experienced the fire of God's jealousy against human evil. Right. It actually did happen. It God actually did pour out the consuming fire of his wrath in his jealousy Right. While all people were gathered together. That's right. But it was on his son. Yeah, on him. Wow. And then, at that time, I will change the speech of my people. Mm-hmm. That fire falls again, Yeah. but changes those same people. Sp- they came back. Yeah, the- it's the difference between eight and nine. Yeah. Eight, it's a consuming fire on Jesus. Yeah. Nine, it's a purifying fire on and the us. apostles. Yeah. Ah. Oh. It's really good. That's, that's really good. It's <laughs> really good. That's pretty amazing. And here, can I just do a fun thing? Oh, we're about to get. Was that to, not the fun thing? Oh, I mean, that's a, that. <laughs> that is a fun thing. But we get to in verse seventeen. Like God rejoices us over us with gladness. He quiets us with His love. He sings over us with loud. Oh, singing. we're going here now. Let's, I know. Yeah. I, I skipped a little things, but yeah. I'm wondering if one way to think about this is like the day of Pentecost. Yeah, is God's song? Mm. It's a tongue of fire. Right. Right. Like, what do tongues do? They sing. They speak. They say things. What's the first miracle the tongues accomplish is the proclamation in words of a message over his people that they've been purified Mm. because the wrath has already been done away with. Right. The Lord God is in your midst. Yes. There was the flaming tongues. God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He'll rejoice over you with gladness and quiet you by his love with singing. And it's like, what's the song that he sang? It's the gospel story. It's, it's the gospel story. On the lips of Peter. Th- right. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. For me, I was like, I wonder if that's the, one of the songs that God sings over his people. Oh, absolutely. Or one of the songs he has sung in history over his people. Yeah. It was when his burning, jealous tongue came out and purified his people of all evil so that they might go into all the world and preach the good news that the humble will inherit the earth and all pride will come. How do we know this? Because in Jesus, pride was destroyed and the humble was exalted, the highest throne possible. Yeah, it's amazing. And so it also answers the question of like, how can verses 11 to 13 of chapter three be true? That you have these people who are Mm -hmm. completely humble, who don't speak lies, who don't do injustice, right? who don't have a deceitful tongue. Yeah, How yeah. can that be true of anybody? Well, it can be true of those who are indwelt by the Spirit of Jesus. That's right. At least partially now. Yeah, right. And like we will never be judged for those things now. In verse 15, it says the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. Mm. You know, it's like there is a sense that like, We've been so thoroughly cleaned of those things because of what Jesus has done for us. We will never be judged for those things again. Yeah. But uh, the reality is that injustice and lies still exist, oh, yeah. particularly among God's covenant community, which Zephaniah is largely directed at. Right. So what does that mean? That this prophecy isn't just fulfilled when Jesus comes and Pentecost happens. Yep. But there's another day of purifying fire coming right. too. Like there's a day when this will be true. Totally and, and, finally and finally as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.
All right, so the last section of Zephaniah then, starting in verse 14, kind of starts with a command that I never thought would be present in this book right. of such sadness <laughs> and inevitable sad. destruction. And, right. It's like there's a consuming fire coming. There's nothing you can do about it. 314, so sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. I'm like, what? what? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes back to what we've been saying. Like the judgment is inevitable. You can't escape it. But what is the hope for the humble? That on the other side of the coming judgment, mm-hmm. you will inherit the earth. And on the other side of coming judgment, God's people will be purified. And on the other side of coming judgment, there will be a day of like total transformation, mm-hmm. not just purifying of the bad actors. It's not like there's four people, two of them are good, two of them bad, and only two of those, only two remain. It's also the two that remain are totally purified yeah. and the, they do no injustice. So like, don't worry. On the other side of death is everything you've hoped for. Mm. So rejoice. Yeah. Rejoice in the death. Right. Which sing in the prison. Sing in the prison. Yeah. And that's also the story of the gospel. This is why we sing songs celebrating Jesus' death. Right. Because we know that on the other side of Jesus' death is a transformed life, and the other side of our death is life with him forever. Yeah. Like that's that's what Christians do. That's what mm. believers in the God of the Bible do is they sing because they know that after death is always life. Wow. So it's interesting then. So God calls us to sing because we know this truth. Mm -hmm. And then we hear that God is singing too. Yeah. And he's singing over us. Like what on earth? This is such a... (laughs) Right, right. right. (laughs) It's such a quoted verse of the Bible, and I think rightfully so. It's so strikingly unique in the picture it paints of God. Mm-hmm. that he mm-hmm. sings over us with gladness and rejoicing. Like, yeah. that is such a glimpse into the heart of God. And it's so unique. And by unique, I mean singular. Yeah, I, don't, I can't think of another time God sings in Scripture. There's probably another one, there but probably I cannot, is. I cannot like, think of it. This does feel so singular that I almost want to write it off. Right. Like uh, It's an artistic flourish. Right. It's yeah. a metaphor. You know, but what what's being said here that I need to walk away with? I'm surrounded by death, inevitable destruction, and yet to the humble and those who are rejoicing in God, God is also rejoicing in them. Like, is that true? <laughs> like, it's just crazy. Well, one thing that I keep thinking about this, I just, I've never thought about this before. Okay. I wonder, like, because we're singing, knowing that on the other side of death is inevitable mm-hmm. life. So I'm wondering if this is a description of Jesus singing with us. Mm. The Lord our God is in our midst. The mighty one who has saved us. And he rejoices with us in gladness and he quiets us with his love and he exults over us with loud singing because he's singing the same song we are. Right. It's like we're commanded to sing victories on the other side of death. Right. And Jesus actually can sing that song too because right. he's lived it himself. Yeah. And so if I'm just imagining in an average Friday, Friday, I don't go to church on Friday, <laughs> average Sundays, <laughs> average Sunday service and looking at people and how encouraging that is. Yeah. I like seeing them sing truth and things. Right. But I'm looking to my left and seeing Jesus proclaim the same the things same I'm thing. seeing. Oh, the God in yeah. my midst singing that death is not the end. Right. I'm like, oh man, that's pretty powerful. That's very powerful. I've never thought about that. I don't think that's what this this is necessarily saying. Sure. But I'm like, oh, but that isn't not what it's saying. Right. Like it's a, that is a, one, way one way to understand this. It. But yeah, that, uh-huh. there's that one of the haunting lines to me and haunting in a really good way, like haunting in the way that I don't understand the depths of God's love for me <laughs> is like that he will exult, E-X-U-L-T, mm-hmm. over me with loud singing. So like it's not exult, wow. right? A- E-X-A-L-T. Meaning? He's not exalting me, like, placing me high, yeah. worshiping me. Okay. That would be bad. <laughs> right, right. But he is exulting over me, which an, to exult is to feel joy. Rejoice. Okay. Rejoice. Yeah. And to like to like be all bubbled up inside with mm-hmm. pride and like good pride and good feelings and mm-hmm. happy thoughts and love and, and then it bubbles out in loud singing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's like to think that God looks at his humble people singing their songs of praise about how life is on the other side of death. And when he sees that, the heart of God 
exults, yeah, rejoices, bubbles up with joy, so much so that he actually erupts in loud songs over me. Yeah. That he's like, I'm singing like, God, you are good. And he's saying, yes, my son, I am. Right. Is like this circular song that I have with mm. my father. Yeah. That is so intimate and beautiful. I'm also thinking of the way that it's like, he's rejoicing that I'm here. Mm. Because there was a version of history where maybe I wasn't there. Why I didn't humble myself. The purifying fire came. Right. There are people that are not standing here. Right. And he's singing over me, rejoicing that you, you Seth, you, you here, you made it, you made it. Yeah. Praise God that you right. made it here. Oh, you know, man. like he's like that. You pray that we are there. That his chosen kids yeah. are there with him in this new world. That we are the ones that have inherited the earth. He's singing yeah. over us that it's us and not others. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's powerful. It is a beautiful thought and truth. And so. Seth and I, we, we're doing something unique with this episode because of that. Oh, yeah. One of our dear, dear friends, uh, his name's Tyler Hayes. Mm-hmm. He's actually the worship pastor at um, my church, Bridgeway, where Seth used to be a pastor. Um, and he's one of Seth's closest friends. Uh, he wrote a song called Sing Over Me based yeah. on this passage. And he sent it to us. And We're going to link to it at the end of the episode. But we're also, I'm going to put it in this episode yes, too. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. We'll link to it and it'll be yeah, at the end so of the episode. After we say goodbye. Right. Stay on the line, and it's you'll so be able beautiful. to listen to the whole song. And it's it's one of my all time favorite worship songs. It I, really I is. cry almost every time. It's it's so good. Uh, so because um, like I don't know what what else to say with words. To right. Talk because about I don't this. have a good visual metaphor for another man singing over me. Like yeah. like you know it's like like, I, like like my dad at bedtime or something. Like as a kid, is the only thing I have in yeah, my head. Exactly. Which is, I think is a good image. Yeah. Like. A dad lovingly singing over his kids yeah. before he puts them down. Yeah. Like, oh, that's such a great image. But like it's stronger than that. Because I have a hard time just imagining a grown man just singing. loud singing with pure joy in his heart. Right. I would just be really embarrassed and awkward. <laughs> I'd be yeah. very awkward about that scenario. Yeah. And I'm imagining I'll pro- be pretty awkward in heaven at some point because like I'm not used to this level of affection from God. Any. Stop gushing over me so much. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know who I am. Uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. He's like, I know, and I love you, and here's my song. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, you're so good. So we'll, that'll be at the end. Yeah. Uh, but we have a few verses left. What we have I, ni- nineteen and yeah, I want nineteen and twenty. The last okay. two verses, and here's what they say. At that time, I will deal with all your oppressors. And I will save the lame, I will gather the outcast, mm. and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. So he's going to make the lame and the outcast well-known, renown. He's mm. going to exalt them over all the earth. And then at that time I'll bring you in, at that time I'll gather you together, and I will make you my people, the, my humble people, renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth. And I just thought about that for a while. Part of the good news... And we've talked about it in different ways throughout this these two episodes, is that both our world and we ourselves will consider us differently after the day of the Lord. Hmm. The shame of the lame will turn to praise and renown. I think those the world and we like count as less will be given like a public and global dignity they haven't had before. Right. We can think too little of what Jesus' day of the Lord does for us. Like, we're clean. We're pure. We're sons. We're heirs. We're rulers. We're empowered by a spirit. And we dismiss all those things really, really quickly, right? (laughs) Partly because our world doesn't really count those categories as significant, so it's easy for us to discount those categories as significant. But nevertheless, there's a dignity and honor that God has planned for everybody uh, every one of his humble servants and one day he will broadcast that honor on a worldwide scale yeah and i just i couldn't stop thinking about this idea that i am not ready for that no that like i often think that humility is about refusing to be lifted up and refusing to think too highly of myself but the end of humility is recognition exaltation renown yeah. pr- global praise you know, like that is, yeah, yeah, yeah. blows my mind. It's like for all the times I feel forgotten and like humility always goes unseen and punished. Like I, that, I have good news for those moments. Yeah. My humility is never wasted. My moments of shame and ignominy 
will not be so always. No. One day it will be publicly and globally rewarded yeah. by God. It reminds me of that scene in The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Okay. Where, you know, the main character's in heaven and yeah. he's kind of watching things unfold and explaining the reality of heaven as he sees it. And he sees a few, like a parade start to go by, I think. Uh, I haven't read it in a while. Yeah. But, uh, and oh, oh, there's a guy. Okay, cool. Oh, there's an, oh, oh, he's on a fancier float. And uh-huh. oh, there, oh, this guy seems like he has a little bit more renown. And I think he recognizes a few of them. He's like, oh, that was that preacher. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, like, yes. Oh, I know that guy. He saved a uh, one million souls. Wow, no wonder he's in this parade. Like, I mean, he had such a crazy impact for the kingdom. Yeah. But then it's like um, the scene in Aladdin, make way for Prince Ali. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. it's like this litany of elephants and golden camels and all this stuff. And the main character is just like, oh, who, who's going to come out? Billy Graham? You know, yeah, like, yeah, what? You know, who is this guy? And the, there's like this, this like small woman on top of an elephant, I think riding in this parade, exalted above all the rest. And he looks at her, he's like, I've never seen this woman in my life. And his guide is like, yeah, no one has, but she's like the humblest of all. And now her fame gets broadcast all around heaven. It's <laughs> amazing. And it's like, yeah, I'm not ready for that kind of right adoration, that direct yeah. love of a proud father. Right. And probably because I am not humble. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> It made me, you, as you were telling that story, it made me think of a, a piece of art I saw when I was in Turkey. I went to this old basilica, and the whole thing was painted. Yeah. Because when it was built, most people couldn't read, so they painted their doctrine on the walls. Their right. Bible stories on the walls. And it was this long line of saints entering into heaven. And right there, there was a man, and they all had, you knew they were saints because they had the halos on their head. At the entrance to heaven, putting people in is just a man uh, carrying a cross. And they all prayed past him. And our tour guide was explaining, this man is the thief on the cross. Mm. And he said, he stands at the entrance of heaven to know that it was not the great deeds of all these men that brought them in, but God's grace towards the humble. Wow. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And like Turkey, like, you know, basic, there's not very many Christians in Turkey. It's functionally an unreached people group. But our tour guide was a Christian. He said, I tell that story every time I take a tour group here. Yeah. And people like break down crying who have never heard the gospel before and like it's like oh and that's the gospel that the humble will be placed at the gate of heaven yeah renowned among all (laughs) anyway that's that's beautiful that's the book of zephaniah that's the book of zephaniah pentecost undone undone pentecost Uh, sorry sorry pentecost undoes the tower of babel the tower of babylon Uh, babylon Babylon is undone undone. yeah uh because jesus was the humble one who faced death Mm -hmm. who had no lies in his mouth Mm -hmm. and created a pasture of sheep imbued with his spirit that could inherit the earth inherit the earth yeah that's really cool okay well um that's it for zephaniah stay tuned on this episode to listen to tyler hayes's song it's really sing over me i've cried many times singing this song. yes so we hope it blesses you all thank you for listening and we'll see you next time Let me hear the song you sing The song of sweet redemption The song of sweet affection The song of love Cause my shame is getting louder And the lies are at my door Whispering Oh, I need to hear you, Father Sing over me Sing over me Sing over me
Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next week.